All right, I wanna welcome everyone to the July uh, 2021 DSUA webinar. Um, I'm Jerry Hunt, your current DSUA president. Uh, I see folks still, still chiming in here and, and popping in. So um, just wanna get everyone started with a quick introductory and uh, welcome. So thanks for everyone that's joined. If you guys have been here before, you kind of know what these webinars are all about. You know what DSUA is all about. If this is your first time, uh, the quick story is DSUA, the Dry Scrubber Users Association. It's a nonprofit organization. It's been around since 2008, and the objectives and goals are to essentially prevent, promote collaboration and innovation in the whole dry scrubbing industry, as well as give a means to help network and connect folks, vendors, and users uh, to help optimize and improve the dry scrubbing solution. So anything spray dryer, circulating dry scrubber, dry sorbent injection related. Hopefully this is the organization for you and you can find some value in it. Uh, historically, we would do annual conferences, but because of COVID, we've ultimately pivoted and had to do these, uh, these monthly webinars, which positive feedback, they've been going really well. Something we started last year and it's something that at least for the foreseeable future, we're gonna kind of continue doing these things. And hopefully next year we can get back to doing a in-person conference as well to kind of supplement these webinars. In lieu of that, this year, the one, one activity uh, for folks that want to get together in person, uh, Dry Scrubber Users is looking to, uh, is planning to participate and be an active member in the Enviro Summit this year. Um, that's going to be something that takes place in September 14th through 17th in Charlotte, North Carolina. And again, that'll be an in-person event. Uh, they've got various tracks on not just air quality, but uh, wastewater treatment, remediation, as well as vapor intrusion. So we're going to be participating uh, with some, some subjects, uh, some matter in the air quality breakouts. So if you're interested in getting together in person, want to network, see, you know, get sick of these webinars, want to do, uh, actually see in-person conferences. I know we've missed them all. Uh, you know, come, come check this one out. This will be a great one. And you'll find some folks from Dry Scrubber users there. Uh, if you go to the DSUA homepage at the bottom, you'll find out more information. Uh, how to sign, how to how to register. Uh, you want to look at the agenda. Uh, if you're coming through DSUA, uh, there's a 25% discount. So all that information is there. Or send us an email if you have questions. Now moving on to today, uh, as far as today's webinar goes, you're going to hear presentations from uh, uh, Steve Kosler of Lungstrom as well as Joe Haney from Industrial Accessories Company IAC. And this webinar is gonna be recorded and we will upload it to YouTube. So it'll be on a public forum. So if you have to leave early or you know someone that wants to see it, uh, it should be available uh, within the next couple of days or week or so. We'll be out there, we'll distribute it and uh, feel free to come back and, and revisit and look at it and watch it and share it to anyone that you want. So it'll be out there for future viewing. Uh, before we get started, I do wanna make sure we uh, acknowledge our sponsors and I'm gonna share my screen. So hopefully everyone's seeing my screen right now as uh, a big thanks to our sponsors this year, again, being a nonprofit organization. Uh, you know, we, our sponsors do a lot for us to kind of help keep the mission going for keep dry scrubbers afloat so that hopefully we got some money in the bank. We can keep putting on these webinars, keep trying to do new things and evolve. And hopefully in 2022, we can actually get together in person. And they do a lot to contribute to the dry scrubber, uh, the dry scrubbing industry for a multitude of reasons. So I want to acknowledge and thank some of them. And starting off with our newest, uh, newest sponsor, this is uh, Noltec Systems. Noltec is a global bulk material handling equipment systems provider, and they like to partner with their clients so that they across many industries. And they've been around since 2005, providing innovative DSI solutions. So at least in terms of DSI, if you guys have been in the US and around um, the DSI solution, you've probably come across Noltec. But they also have technical expertise as well as the technology. So you're looking for an efficient, sustainable system to help all their end users for acid gas compliance, um, you know, reach out to Noltec. And they were a co-presenter co in the May 2021 DSUA webinar. So that's on the website that's out there. Feel free to check that out. You'll kind of learn a little bit more about what they do and what they're about. Let's see if my slides will advance. There we go. National Filter Media is another one of our sponsors. Uh, they're proud to be one of the world's oldest and largest providers of air pollution control and liquid filtration products. 
uh, they've been successful in adhering to the same business principles and practices that they've been doing since they were founded in 1906. So while they, they believe in building partnerships and earning trust with their end users continuously, so they, they feel strongly about, you know, kind of doing that on a daily basis to provide value for their end users as well as their, um, as well as their products. So the filtration technologies have changed a lot since they've come around, but their commitment principles have not. So the NFM, National Filter Media, they've been folks that have been around and supported the SUA, been present. So, you know, you're, any, any of this is of interest to you and back house side of things, you know, reach out to them, give them a call. Uh, Leckler is another one of our sponsors. They've been around in the industry for over 140 years with experience in designing and manufacturing spray solutions for air quality control systems. Uh, they've got a wide range of whether it's nozzles, lances, valve stands, mist eliminators. So if you're looking for solutions on, gas, say, a gas cooling or purification, denitrification, or desulfurization, um, and, and you need nozzles, you know, Leckler is your folks, one of your folks to reach out to. They also can provide technical support by advising customers with custom solutions so they can help meet their stringent compliance needs and achieve stringent uh, emission requirements. And their experts also understand this technology and, you know, they can provide expertise to help with the solutions and uh, develop partnerships to ultimately make sure that this solution, your, your spraying systems are um, operating efficiently and properly. Uh, Stuart McKenzie from Leckler has been someone that's worked with us this year as a DSUI, DSUA advisor. Uh, he's been very helpful for us and he gave a presentation on the March 2021 webinar with JEA. So if you learned uh, want to learn a little bit more about Leckler that's a, and hear from Stuart, go check out that webinar. Gecko Robotics, for those that have been around DSUA, there's another name you're familiar with. They've got the revolutionary robotic technology for doing inspections of industrial infrastructure. So these wall climbing robots perform these inspections along with their, uh, their inspection team. They're doing these NDT inspections across the globe, not just the US. Uh, the robotic technology enables the execution of these routine inspections and they get a comprehensive set of data as, at high speeds, but they can do it most importantly safely in hazardous environments. Uh, Gecko has been an avid DSUA supporter. Uh, back to Dave Kahn from Gecko, who was a previous VP and continues to kind of support us sort of offline, as well as Sam and Amanda that kind of helped us kind of get on, get on board with the Zoom platform this year for the webinars. So if you're looking to find out a little bit more about what Gecko does, check out the February 2021 webinar from Michael Paul Jenkins. Another one of our sponsors is Redicam. They provide an extended range of flue gas treatment equipment throughout a multitude of industries. They service their end users with technologies, again, meeting stringent acid gas emission reduction requirements in a cost-effective manner. Uh, they've got a wealth of experience that they've been doing this for over four decades uh, with, with their operating experience. So if you've got a retro, you need to retrofit a solution or you got a greenfield site and you're looking at one of these dry scrubbing solutions, they can be a reliable partner to help you achieve your objectives. And they've been instrumental in helping us as well. Uh, Salvatore Gallo has been an advisor for DSUA this year, and he's been also very helpful working with us. Mississippi Lime, again, another familiar name to DSUA. Um, they're a world-class provider of calcium-based products, including quick lime, hydrated lime, and calcium carbonate. They've got over 100 years producing products from one of the richest limestone reserves in the world. And they supply uh, a wide range of products across the world from over a dozen plants and terminals. So their high quality quick lime hydrated lime products are, can be used cost effectively in a multitude of dry scrubbers, whether it's a SDA, the CDS or DSI applications, they've got a product for you there. And Kurt Bean is part of the DSUA board and you can learn more uh, about Mississippi Lime and uh, enhanced hydrated lime fundamentals if you wanna check out the March 2021 20, webinar that uh, Kurt Bean did for us. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And I am going to introduce today's moderator, the face and name you're probably pretty familiar with. Uh, we got Mr. Mitch Lund here. Mitch has been a DSUA advisor that's been supporting us with the webinar coordination. So a lot of the stuff off the grid, offline that you guys don't see to help pull these together, Mitch has been instrumental in that. Um, he's a chemical engineer and he's currently out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. He spent nearly a decade 
in the air pollution control solutions industry, primarily with uh, dry sorbent injection technologies. And he previously worked for Noltec Solutions and he was responsible for all their sales strategy and technology innovation in their environmental solutions division. So this is right up his wheel well. Uh, Mitch currently, he has a, he's a one man show as a technical consultant for Mitch Lund Solutions. So I'm gonna turn over to Mitch to introduce our speakers. Appreciate that, Jerry. Yeah, um, great introduction. Don't don't need to say anything else myself. If uh, uh, I am a one man band, uh, technical consultant, so um, just helping helping out end users uh, all of the United States primarily uh, with both new equipment and optimizing equipment, uh, existing equipment, I should say. So here to help if uh, if you guys need it. Uh, other than that, I'll get right into it and in introducing our first speaker, uh, Mr. Stephen Kostler. Uh, just a quick background before he gets into uh, presenting about um, how air preheaters can be part of a solution for operational flexibility and savings. Um, Mr. Kostler, Stephen, is, um, is a PE, process engineer, and a, a business development manager with uh, Lungstrom. He has uh, 14 years experience in power, uh, AQCS, water, uh, solids, waste, material handling, and oil and gas industries. So he's been around the block. Um, he's played an important role in everything from project development to regulatory affairs to technology development, capital projects, consulting services, uh, everything from start to finish. So he's a good resource. And um, Stephen, without further ado, why don't you uh, get started on telling us how air preheaters um, can be a solution for operational flexibility and savings for end, end customers? Yeah, thanks, Mitch. Great introduction. I, I couldn't have written it better myself. <laughs> Let me share my screen here. How are we looking? Y'all see that okay? Getting some nods and some thumbs up. So thanks, thanks DSUA for the platform. And thank you all for joining the live broadcast. I think I see 30 something of you guys. So Thanks for taking the time today to listen in. Um, so yeah, like Mitch said, my name is Stephen Kostler. The title of my presentation is quite the mouthful. I've been uh, told that by a, a few folks already. So thanks for the feedback before even starting. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about Youngstrom's newest product line, which is Advex, specifically Advex Flex, and how it can help with some operational constraints, some of which are specific to dry scrubber users. So uh, as mentioned prior to Youngstrom, prior to joining Youngstrom in 2019, I spent the majority of my career as an air pollution control engineer and consultant. Um, so I'm more familiar with that side of the business, uh, still coming up to speed on the air preheater and how it integrates uh, and all the mechanics around it. So. I'm, I'm, I guess I, I like to say I'm more like you guys than a, than a air, air preheater guy. Uh, chemical process engineer by day, salesman by night. Uh, my colleagues say that my main role within the organization is giving unwanted advice, which I would agree that I am pretty good at. So a uh, quick roadmap, I'll begin by setting the stage with an introduction outline some specific operational constraints, introduce Advex Flex, what it is, principles of operation, and then address how it can solve or mitigate the operational constraints identified. I'll finish up with a quick discussion on heat rate and then leave some time for Q&A. So let's begin, shall we? So I think we can all agree that coal plants don't operate like they used to. These units are cycling and operating at lower capacity factors more often. They're also being asked to run at lower loads than they typically have been able to in the past. When a lot of these back end or downstream of the air heater, air quality control system projects were being designed, the generation profiles were different. Therefore, many of these systems, including dry scrubbers, were not installed with significantly lower loads or capacity factors in mind. These new generation profiles can cause headaches, operational issues, and constraints. So we began to ask ourselves, is there something that we can do with the air preheater or air preheater operation that would help relieve some of these constraints at low load? So 
So here's my list. I've got six operational constraints here that we're going to talk about today. Um, three specific to spray dryer absorbers and circulating dry scrubbers. Three that are pretty general to coal plants. Uh, perhaps you can identify a few more, maybe even share them with me, um, but these will be the focus of our discussion today. Uh, SDA and CDS constraints uh, include SO3 removal, or excuse me, SO2 removal, wastewater evaporation capacity, and minimum operating load or, or temperature. Unit constraints may include cold moisture or mill temp, average cold end temperature, which is ASET, which is an air, air preheater term and issue and uh, acid gas dew point on your, on your back end. These constraints may actually exist in some form or fashion along the entire load spectrum. However, in general, as load decreases, the flue gas flow and temperature both decrease, which impacts all of the above. So we'll eventually walk through all of these constraints individually. But first, let me introduce Advex Flex so you know what exactly it is prior to connecting the two. So ADVEX stands for Advanced X-Ratio Management. That's why I spelled the whole thing out in my title. Otherwise, you wouldn't know what, what it meant. So that's part of the reason why it was so long. ADVEX Flex is one of three ADVEX products that we market in the US. So Flex is a, is a patented, simple, low-cost system that employs X-Ratio Management and air heater upgrades to mitigate operational constraints hopefully resulting in less headaches and some savings along the way. The X ratio of an air preheater, if we, if we break it down and simplify it, is the ratio of air to flue gas through the air preheater. Therefore, when we talk about our Advex product line, we are talking about solutions that uh, are solutions in which we modify the X ratio of the air heater for various purposes. With Advex Flex, we bypass air for operational flexibility. See how I did that there, how I highlighted the FLX Advex Flex? It's good, right? <laughs> so exactly what is the typical scope of work for an Advex Flex system that depends on your air heater. But first, let's discuss how Advex is novel and different. At this point, you may say, Steven, isn't, isn't that a bit backwards? If you're trying, I, I can kind of see where you're going. If you're trying to raise the flue gas temperature downstream of the air heater, uh, shouldn't you modify the X ratio by bypassing flue gas around the air heater in order to increase the flue gas outlet temperature of the air heater and then your back end gas path? And I'd say, well, that would be the apparent thing to do uh, if you need more temperature in the flue gas downstream of the air heater, then bypass flue gas around your air preheater. The flue gas would maintain its high temperature and then recombine with the air heater downstream uh, and increase the back end temperature. But that approach actually carries with it some inherent problems. So first, if you have a trisector or a hot primary air preheater, Doing so would actually decrease the temperature of, of both the primary air and the secondary air. You're removing the heat from the heat exchanger by bypassing it around. And so this, this starves or steals energy from both of your uh, air streams. This would impact your mills, making it more difficult to maintain mill temp when the bypass is open. Uh, second, it would actually decrease your average cold end temperature which would exacerbate corrosion of the cold end of the air heater as the flue gas outlet temperature of the flue gas that is still going through the air heater would actually decrease further. And so that would lower your average cold end temperature, uh, which, would, which would hurt you from a corrosion standpoint. And then lastly, uh, that, that temperature drop of the gas going through the air heater before it's recombined with the hot gas could actually put your duct work um, closer to your flue gas acid dew point, causing duct work corrosion until the gas is recombined and the, and the bulk or combined flue gas temperature is elevated. 
So while this may be the, the obvious approach, uh, I think we would agree that there's some impacts here that you would rather likely not do, right? So with Advex Flex, instead of bypassing flue gas, we actually bypass uh, air with a controlled damper and a bypass duct, and, and we also upgrade the air preheater. So doing so, doing it on the air side, also accomplishes the goal of increasing the air heater flue gas outlet temperature since there is less air mass, since there's less air mass for the gas temperature to transfer to in the heat exchanger. Therefore, the flue gas will actually maintain more of its temperature as it goes through the air heater, resulting in a higher back end uh, uh, gas outlet temperature. So it, it, it accomplishes that main purpose, but it has inherent co-benefits as opposed to inherent problems. So for example, here on this slide, this is what an Advex Flex system would look like on a tri-sector air preheater. A tri-sector simply is one air heater in which the primary air and secondary air are different portions of the air side um, of the air preheater. So in dark blue in this diagram, you see there typically these systems already have a primary air bypass duct. Um, utilized to temper the primary air to the mills or control the mill outlet temperature. So the new scope of work would actually be the light blue bypass, uh, which is the controlled bypass duct on the secondary air. So that's simple enough, right? With Advex, not only do you get the desired flue gas outlet temperature increase, but you also get benefits of increasing the primary air temperature, increasing the average cold end temperature of the air preheater, and increasing the difference between the flue gas temperature and the acid dew point. When you include the air heater upgrade, we can also offset the heat rate impact associated with the bypass when the bypass is actually closed. So that's why we throw the air heater upgrade in there as well. So what if you have a bisector air preheater or, a, or sometimes we refer to these as hot primary air preheaters. So it's a similar scope of work um, with a little more scrutiny on, on the ductwork penetrations for the bypass. We would need to add the bypass air back into the secondary air ductwork after the primary air has been separated from the combined air outlet duct. So shown in, shown in the figure. Uh, the principle of operation, however, is the same. With less air mass available for heat transfer, the air outlet temperature, the air outlet temperature will actually increase as well. And so the primary air temperature will be higher when, when it's pulled off prior to the bypassed air recombining with the secondary air. Uh, so in this case, if you have a hot primary bisector, the benefits would be the same. All the co-benefits would be the same as shown in the list. Now, lastly, some of you guys may have separate uh, primary and secondary air preheaters. So if, if that's the case, the scope of work would be very similar, controlled bypass duct, on, but it would be on the secondary air preheater only. The only co-benefit that you would not gain is the temperature increase to the primary air as that's on a completely separate train. So now that we know what Advex Flex is, let's start walking through the operational constraints and how Advex can solve some of the headaches. This may get a bit repetitive, but, but I think it's good, so, so bear with me. So starting off with SO2 removal. Uh, this was actually discussed a bit in a previous DSUA webinar. Uh, so here's your problem statement in red. So we cannot increase reagent to our scrubber due to outlet temperature constraints of the scrubber. Perhaps you have a, uh, upcoming regional haze target, so you need to improve the removal of your scrubber. So as we know, the scrubber outlet temperature is controlled by approach to saturation. You can't saturate the flue gas or you'll be hanging out in, in corrosion city. The inlet temperature is also fixed as a result of the air heater gas outlet temperature. And so therefore you essentially have a fixed inlet and outlet flue gas temps, which limit the amount of reagent that you can inject. Um, you know, the slurry is mostly water that evaporates and lowers the gas temperature, pu pu pushing you closer to saturation. And then at lower load, this only uh, is exacerbated as the flue gas flow and temperature decrease tend to decrease at lower load operation. Uh, 
Um, so what can you do uh, with with Advex Flex? It's it's pretty simple. So we put the bypass in, and as we discussed, that results in less mass available for heat transfer, and so your air heater outlet temperature would increase. Your air heater flue gas outlet temperature would increase, uh, therefore increasing the flue gas temperature to the scrubber, which would allow you to push more reagent into the scrubber at a given load, which could increase your SO2 removal just based on the additional reagent. So in this case, we would design the bypass. We would size it based on how much additional reagent you would like to inject. Hey, Steven, quick question yes, if you can hear me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, on, on that last slide, just in contrast, uh, as opposed to the Advex solution, uh, if folks hit that limitation, what, what have you seen that they've had to do to try and address that scenario typically? Um, I'm not the best person to ask that question to, Jerry. I, but again, I think B&W addressed this in their webinar. I don't know if that was two or three webinars ago. And so that's online and you can look at their discussion on how to improve uh, SO2 removal efficiency out, outside of ADVEX. They, they did note, and it got me thinking that uh, it can be difficult to, to do so and, and expensive. And so I thought ADVEX was a pretty, uh, pretty nice, simple solution to try and improve that. Yeah, sorry for the punt. That was a that was a punt for sure. No, no, it, it, it <laughs> it's all good. You stumped me. Thanks. Mo moving on. Sometimes we'll go back on you. Now. Sometimes <laughs> punting is the best move, Stephen. <laughs> See how I did that. Good. <laughs> all right. Uh, so the next next scrubber operational constraint. So let's talk about wastewater evaporation capacity, or sometimes referred to as process water. Uh, so this is an interesting problem. Also, some some scrubber sites that have dry scrubbers are actually ZLD, meaning they can't discharge process water to a to a body of the water body of the U.S. And so they actually utilize their scrubbers as large evaporators. And at lower capacity factors, these scrubbers can evaporate a lot less water, significantly less water. Um, so here's your problem statement. So we cannot evaporate enough process water to maintain ZLD operation, and this is requiring expensive water treatment um, to solve this problem. So when you break it down, it's very similar to the previous one. Uh, our inlet and outlet temperatures are fixed. We can't get too close to saturation. It's exacerbated at a lower load, so there's less energy available for water evaporation. Sometimes we've seen water balances actually flip at lower load, so there's more water that needs to be treated at lower load. Um, so this can cause a problem. So again, with Advex, we can open up the bypass, increase the temperature to the dry scrubber, and then that would allow you to push more water in this case, um, as opposed to more more reagent slurry into the scrubber and, in, and increase the evaporation capacity of the scrubber. So in that case, we would design the bypass based on how much additional water you're trying to evaporate. Moving on, uh, this, this actually was kind of brought to my attention from a third party, so I'm, I'm curious um, how, how much this actually impacts some of the users here, but uh, there may be a problem or you may have issue with reducing the minimum load that you can operate at due to a minimum temperature requirement in your scrubber. So, you know, we, we have to be at at least temperature whatever in order to bring our scrubber online. And that correlates to some, some load. And, and, and again, now we're being asked to run at lower loads than, than we're used to, but we can't get there because we have this minimum load to our scrubber. Um, again, I think, I think with, with Advex Flex, you can increase the temperature to your scrubber at a different load, at a lower load. And so I think, again, this would be a scenario in which we design the bypass to try to get you that minimum temperature at a lower load so that you can operate there moving forward. I saw Mitch nod his head like that made sense. So I'm going to, I'm going to roll with it. Yeah. Just uh, thinking at least one or two clients that are in that exact same position. It's the, it's where we're at today. Right. So yep. it resonates. Yep. Good. Good. 
Okay, so moving from the scrubber constraints over to the, the unit constraints. Um, first one up here is uh, cold moisture or mill temp. Uh, problem statement, hey, we're having difficulty maintaining mill temperature at lower load, causing wet cold issues. Um, similar limitation here, right? At lower loads, you have less energy in the heat exchanger and the air preheater available which results in lower air temperature, lower primary air temperature. And so you can't dry your coal out as, as, as well as you'd like to. Um, this is one of those co-benefits of flex, right? By bypassing the secondary air, if you have a trisector or a hot bisector, you can actually increase the temperature to the primary air, um, which should help you dry your coal out, and maintain your mill outlet temperature at, at lower loads. In this case, we would design the bypass based on how much additional mill temp you would need. Moving on here, this, this is a graph with a suggested average cold in temperature of the air preheater. So the average cold in temperature is simply the temperature of the air coming in plus the temperature of the gas going out divided by two. And we typically recommend a minute, uh, or an average cold in temperature based on sulfur content of the coal, which is related to SO3 content that the uh, air preheater is going to see um, in, in the acid dew point associated with that SO3 content. So um, average cold and temperature is, is certainly designed at high load. Uh, so at lower load, you're going to operate closer and lower than your recommended average cold and temperature. And so if you're seeing enhanced air heater corrosion because you're operating at lower load more often, then this is likely what's going on. Um, so Advex Flex could improve that by um, bypassing around, around the air heater again, raising your gas outlet temperature on the air preheater and increasing your average cold temperature. Hey, Steve, I, I have a, uh, I'll try not to ask a, quite, a, bad, a bad question. Um, this is somewhat of a general question, but uh, I know enough about air heater, air preheaters to be dangerous, but um, beyond the Advex Flex, like what are just some other considerations that folks who don't know about air heaters need to be aware of in terms of the design that helps address the solution in terms of the effectiveness of the heat capture and as well as, you know, Advex Flex? What, what are just kind of some general things that they should be keeping in the back of their mind as they're also looking at this or other areas where you can talk about Advex Flex, but also, you know, kind of like mm -hmm. further optimize the solution to keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'll get into that a little bit, Jerry. I think, so, so when you're thinking about how this applies to your particular site, you know, you're gonna have to think about how many air preheaters you have, what type of air preheater you have, um, and then how it's operating. You know, what are the inlet and outlet temperatures? Uh, the, the information that we would need to help you be successful is certainly, hey, what temperatures do you have and, and what are you trying to get to? And then we would use our air heater performance modeling tools to size the bypass appropriately um, for the specific scenario that you're looking at. And so one of these six, you, you may only be experiencing one of these six, you may be experiencing all six of these constraints. Uh, I think what's really nice about this is that it actually improves them all. And so we would try to determine, okay, what's your biggest headache? So, and what would drive the bypass so that we would size it to meet that while, um, and then be able to show you what the benefit is for the other other constraints. And then that controlled bypass can be operated and, and controlled based on various constraints. You know, hey, let's open this thing up when we either need more mill temperature or we need a higher gas temperature to, to the scrubber. And so you can even design this thing to kind of kick in and open based on various different inputs. Um, I don't know if that directly answers your question, Jerry, uh, but those are some of kind of the design things to keep in mind. Uh, if you're thinking, hey, how does this apply to me and, and what's it gonna look like? 
you know, another, another thing that's nice about having it on the air side is you're dealing, you're not dealing with uh, difficult flu gas, right? You're just dealing with air and actually air that's really not that hot. And so your materials, the construction can be carbon steel, right? It's, it, it doesn't have to be abrasion resistant or corrosion resistant or, or whatever. Um, and it's, and it's not going to be a hot duct either, right? It's going to be a cold duct. So pretty, pretty simple solution here. Again, I'm not sure I answered your question. Maybe that's my second punt of the, of the webinar. No, no that, that, that was good. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is the last slide here on constraints as a dew point. Uh, this chart has been passed around uh, in the industry quite a lot. It shows acid dew point as a function of SO3 and flue gas moisture content. Um, the takeaway here is obviously the lower you get in your flue gas temperature, the closer you get to acid dew point. And we want to maintain some margin there. And so when operating at lower load, we have less temperature in the flue gas, and we're going to be pushing closer and closer to acid dew point. So maybe your problem is that you're corroding your ductwork faster uh, or your downstream equipment faster because you're operating more at or, or more frequently at lower loads. And so again, flex would increase the back end temperature, which would give you some more margin to stay above your acid dew point. Hey, Stephen, we got a, a question from the audience. If yes, sir. you wouldn't mind. So this is coming from one of our loyal listeners and viewers, Kevin Redinger. So okay. he, um, he asks uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of overall, thermal cycle efficiency. Can you comment how Advex uh, compares to air preheater, air side, steam coil, heater use at lower loads? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, and, and that's a good point. You know, I'm, I'm making the assumption here that you're, you've maxed out your ability or your other tools in your toolbox, right? So using your steam coil is a way to increase your uh, temperature, your flue gas temperature coming out of the air heater, certainly. And so I'm making the assumption that that's, that's maybe getting you halfway or not getting you fully where you need to be. Um, and, and, and maybe you need another, another tool in your toolbox. So to answer the question, use your steam coils first. Um, it's gonna have less of an impact on your unit efficiency than Advex, Advex Flex is. Um, it's not, you know, 10 times better, but it may be 50% better to kind of put a number, a number to it. Um, actually, in this, in this paper that's referenced here on the slide that was written by uh, Dr. Nina Saronic, that, that uh, comparison is actually done. And so you can see the heat rate impact or the efficiency impact between steam coil use and um, air bypass. So if you if you want to get a bit more technical, or I, Mitch, if you send me the contact information, I can send that paper over um, to address that question specifically. Excellent. No, appreciate that, Stephen. No, but yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, uh, use your steam coil first. If you still need another tool, this would be a good, good, good next tool up. And then um, we actually have another question here from, a, from an audience member. Um, asking when the unit runs lower capacity, um, um, the demand, it's more of a clarification, just making sure we're understanding the content. So the question is when the unit runs lower capacity, the demand for absorbent slurry shall also decrease. So the overall thermal balance will give similar SDA outlet temperatures, correct? That, that makes sense? Can you comment oh, or punt? There's still an option to punt. <laughs> Um, well, I, I think what they're getting at, and I've kind of pondered this as well, is, is yeah, at lower loads, sure, um, there's less SO2 load to the scrubber. And, and so um, I think the question, what it's alluding to is, is it proportional? Um, and, and, I, and I think the answer is it's, it's kind of proportional. I believe um, 
and and maybe maybe Travis Reynolds, you can jump in. I know, or or somebody can jump in. I believe that the saturation, the adiabatic saturation of the flue gas is going to be pretty fixed regardless of what load you're at because it's based on the composition of the flue gas. And so your, your outlet temperature or, or your, your kind of stop, if you will, whether you're at full load or low load is going to be about the same temperature based on the saturation limit, you know, for, for talking purposes. Maybe there's some nuances there. And so when you when you reduce load, since the, 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 the back of that equation is fixed, you know, there's more of a squeeze in what you can actually put in, put into the scrubber. So it's not proportional, I would say on both ends. Um, again, I've, I've, I've kind of, <laughs> I haven't done the math to actually fully convince myself. Um, this this proportionality question but the other the other interesting thing about the air heater is it it's not one to one proportion either and so when you take a bypass around it let's say you do a 10% bypass it doesn't have a 10% impact on the temperatures or the energy in and out because the principles of the heater operation it operates on a curve and so a 10% bypass may be only to be like a 2% impact on the heat duty of, of the air preheater. And so there's, you know, there's, there's not really this proportionality associated with it to where the benefits are just a wash. It, it, there's still gonna be a benefit in doing so. Now I'm on record and you're gonna post that on YouTube and somebody's gonna pick, pick it apart, so. <laughs> oh yeah, no, you're, you're, you know, you're toast, you're toast Steven. Once you take a stance, that's when the trolls come out, right? So, no, yeah. um, it's all good. Um, how am I doing on time, Mitch? I got like three more slides. Okay, yeah, I, I keep going. Sorry, keep going. We got okay. some more questions from the audience, but we'll bring those uh, in closer to the end here. Okay, good, good. So I, I got two slides on heat rate here. I uh, wanted to address it. So you may say, hey, Stephen, doesn't, doesn't bypassing the secondary air cause a decrease in efficiency like we talked about earlier? Yes, it, it does. It will impact heat rate when the bypass is open. Uh, when the bypass is closed, it won't impact heat rate. So, so our thought here is kind of twofold. You know, in, in general, again, these are typically low load issues when your heat rate is already pretty bad. Uh, anyways, um, the heat rate impact isn't significant. I mean, it's, it's there, but it would be kind of, it may even be in the noise, um, it, it, as some people may argue. Uh, so we, we do kind of see this as another tool in the toolbox to be used when it makes sense to do so. You know, we should, you should ask yourself, uh, should I take a heat rate hit here versus having to deal with one of these other problems, right? Does it make sense to continue to corrode my air heater until it falls apart or should I take a small heat rate hit or is kind of the cost benefit analysis you should be asking yourself. Um, and it's and it's not a step change. It's a controlled bypass. So you can use it when you need to. You can close it when you don't need to. And then there won't be a heat rate impact associated with it. And so that's why with Flex, we also propose to upgrade the air heater. Again, in general, we think this is a, a lower load issue. And so by upgrading your air heater, you can actually improve the heat rates when your bypass is closed, thus recovering some of that heat rate that's lost uh, when the bypass is open. And then based on how you operate and your load profile, it can result in a net, you know, zero heat rate impact, or it could actually result in a heat rate improvement based on your air heater and how much you gain out of the, out of the upgrade. So that could be one way to address the heat rate um, issue. So, um, I like this quote. It says, operation of an air heater represents a compromise between performance and maintenance. And this, this fellow is a really smart guy. Uh, you may ask yourself next, you know, but if I upgrade my air heater and I capture more energy and improve my heat rate, I'm reducing my back end temperature, then won't that push me closer to acid dew point? And, and the answer is yes. But here's another quote from a not, not so smart guy. You know, we just need to remove the SO3 in front of, in front of the air heater. And, and by doing that, it will lower your acid dew point. Um, 
hey, the U.S. market is pretty mature in terms of SO3 control, meaning that it's been shown and proven over and over again that when you remove the SO3, um, you can actually unlock a lot more potential in your in your air preheater, recover more heat, um, and also gets rid of the corrosion and the buildup that SO3 causes in, in air preheater. Hey, Steven, real quick. Sorry, your, your sound just got, at least on my end, it, it kind of dropped off a little bit. I don't know if it's, uh, just wanted to give you a heads up. I don't know if there's anything you adjust. I just want to make sure your comments don't get unheard by everyone. Mm -hmm. Do what you can to, to talk closer to the uh, microphone, Stephen, but we'll just let our audience know that that's it's happening to us too. So, that, so not, not on their end, so keep going. Okay, okay. So the, the point of this slide was, hey, if you don't control your SO3 upstream of the air heater, do so. It's well proven, it's mature. Um, there's many benefits. It'll help with the corrosion. It'll help with the heat recovery. It'll help with the buildup. So um, there's plenty of folks on this uh, in DSUA and on this webinar. I'd we'll be happy to help you with that. All right. So I, in the la, in the la, just to, real quick on that point for you, uh, your last slide. I, I my, me personally, I think the one interesting thing about your last comment about uh, talking about DSI is that um, you know someone may be sitting there saying. Why would I need DSI for, I have a spray dryer. I, why do I need DSI, I have a CDS. Um, everything that you've kind of talked about with the air preheater and your point about this slide, you know, can help answer that question because it's not about the compliance, it's about economics. There's the potential there. So to me, I think it's interesting because you're potentially talking about coupling two different dry scrubber technologies and optimizing your solution further based on economics. Good, thanks, Jerry. Um, so yeah, to wrap up, look, this is a, this is a simple low cost system that can help with six that I've identified operational constraints all, all in one. So there's a lot of code benefits and um, upgrading the air heater could negate or improve heat rate when the bypass is closed. And we'd be happy to work with you or your engineer to, um, to, to do a, do an assessment. We're happy to do a free assessment, show you guys what's possible with your air per year, what can be done. Um, my contact information is on the slide. So that's all I got. Thanks again for your time and attention today. Had fun with it. Um, and I'll open that up for further questions, Mitch. We got, we got about two minutes or so, um, but we do have a couple of questions. We'll see if we can get to it. Um, this one, I, I guess, uh, this was kind of a comment, but to turn around as a question, so in terms of the ADVEX solution and what you presented, is the, is the considerations of the solution different between, in terms of what you can gain from it between say an SDA versus a CDS because of the fact that CDS, you can have independent water injection? Yeah, I was thinking about that. I think some of this is dependent on what you have, whether you have a SDA or a CDS. So I think the limit, for example, the limitation on how much reagent you can inject, I think that's that's specific to an SDA, correct? Because you're injecting a, a slurry, so your delivery mechanism for the reagent into the SDA comes with water, right? And so that's what's causing your limitation. I can't push more water here. So perhaps that's not an issue um, or, or as much of an issue with a, with a CDS system where you just say, hey, I'm gonna just blow in more reagent and keep my water uh, fixed that, that I have there. Again, I'm not um, an expert in terms of scrubber chemistry, the dry scrubber chemistry. So maybe somebody else can jump in and comment on that. Well, and I think to the point too, is at, at the end of the day, all these solutions are custom solutions. They're custom operating constraints, custom process conditions, even if we're talking about coal plants, if, different temperature profiles, different air heater designs, different scrubber designs, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is to me, you know, you can't really answer that question generally. The economics all depend on all of those things that have to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. I actually, I actually changed the picture on this slide to an SDA for that, for that reason. Cause I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was applicable to a CDS and somebody would have said, 
I, I tried. I tried to make it right for you guys. Well, that's cool. Um, so we do have a couple more questions. We'll just knock these out before we um, transition to the next uh, presenter. Um, so we got one question, more of a, just a clarification. I'm not sure if they, they might have missed the first slide, but they, they're asking is Advex uh, provided, um, is it a shell and tube heat exchanger or is it actually a special type of heat exchanger? But the, the, if you were to summarize that in, in a sentence, Stephen, it sounds like it'd be a customized uh, sure. air heater bypass system, correct? Right. So when you think about an Advex system, uh, it's it's a three things uh, are are in an Advex system. So uh, the first part of an Advex system is uh, the X ratio shift, and so that is the bypass of either air or flue gas um, through the air preheater. Um, the, the second part is, is the air heater upgrade associated with an ADVEX system. And so we deal, I work for Youngstrom. So we're talking Youngstrom rotary regenerative air preheaters, um, not a shell and tube or uh, tubular air preheater. Um, and then lastly is the, the energy application. So how are we managing the change in energy when we shift the X ratio? And so for flex, Advex flex, it's man using the energy for, uh, or sending that energy back to the back end for these operational constraints. Uh, the two other products we have are Advex HRI, which is heat rate improvement. You, there is actually going back into your thermal cycle to improve uh, efficiency. I'll be actually talking about that at the Enviro Summit. Um, conference. I got a, got, a, got a presentation there. And then the other product in the U.S. is Advex ZLD, where we use that energy. We push it to a spray dryer evaporator to evaporate wastewater without a heat rate impact. So um, hopefully that answers the question, Mitch. If, if oh, that's that's, that's great. Um, so it's certainly more, uh, more descriptive than my uh, dumbed down version. So appreciate that, Stephen. Um, we also just so we're going to transition to the next speaker. We have one more question from Thomas Pickerel, but just to stay on on time here, we're going to take that question offline, Stephen, and allow you to um, give you the time to to answer that correctly rather than rush through it. So, uh, Thomas, for instance, we'll, we will we will follow up with you offline on that. So, thank you for the question, um, Stephen. Great presentation. Uh, thank you for the. Uh, it was great information and. Um, we're not judging for punts. So just that's that's my main takeaway here. So great, great work. I'm looking forward to working with you at the Enviro Summit. Um, and then without further ado, I'll transition over to Jerry to give some more shout outs to our uh, sponsors and then we'll get going with Joe. Thank you, Stephen. So hopefully I'm unmuted and you can see my screen. Um, again, I'll go quickly go through, we got some more sponsors again, wanna recognize. Um, Lawast North America, whoop, already skipping through that, not that fast. Um, Lawast North America, they're a subsidiary of the Lawast Group. They're also a global limestone, quick lime, hydrated lime, and silicates company, uh, including their enhanced hydrated lime sorbents, uh, sorbent count SP and SPS. They're engineered to optimize the dry scrubbing application solutions for acid gas controls, uh, such as a spray dryer or a CDS application. And it's utilized in a, a multitude of EGUs and uh, industrial facilities. And if you want to learn more than about LAWAST and uh, enhanced hydrated lime products and DSI, uh, check out Ian Saratovsky's DSUA webinar from last year, as well as LAWAST's um, kind of pseudo podcast thing that's up on YouTube in the DSUA page that they did as part of their sponsorship. Our next sponsor is Reaction Analytics Solutions Corporation. They specialize in engineering solutions using computational fluid dynamic or CFD modeling. The founder, Dr. Guisu Lu, spent over two decades in fuel combustion as well as emission control industry and developed over 100 CFD model based solutions. So he's an expert in both front end combustion as well as the back end FGT and can support with the CFD modeling for either one of those applications including process chemistry to optimize the interfacing of chemicals and the exhaust gas. 
So for those of you who uh, viewed the May 2021 webinar, we see presented there was a great presentation about the capabilities of the CFD modeling and uh, practical applications. So if you want to learn more, that's a great one to check out as it pertains specifically to dry sorbent injection and how it was utilized. Uh, process, Primex process specialists, they provide comprehensive support for dry scrubber users such as SDA, again, CDS, DS, DSI. So help them optimize their scrubbing performance as well as their operations. They've got over two decades of customer successes that you can see here their clientele. Uh, some customer successes that they've demonstrated based on their unique combination of their scrubber knowledge, as well as the technology they offer and just ultimately their patients. Um, when you're dealing with folks like me and Mitch here, you have to be very patient. So, um, and if you want to learn more about, about Primex and Stuart Nicholson, is, if you've been around DSUA, it's a, it's a name that you've, you've seen and come across. He's presented as well as uh, Stephen Cornelli. Um, uh, November 2020, they did a, a great DSUA pre presentation with the Dry Fork Station about uh, utilizing being able to optimize CDS performance. And then Stuart also gave a presentation earlier this year about SDAs and detecting slurry atomization operational issues and how to optimize that. So some, some good stuff. You wanna find out more about Primex, um, you can check out those webinars. Uh, Integrated Global Solutions or IGS. They're an international provider of surface protection and material handling solutions. And they've got over three decades of experience helping their customers solve metal wastage, ash accumulation, and just overall general reliability problems related to mission critical equipment. So they have, uh, they're an industry leader in the development and application of the solutions for both corrosion and erosion problems. If you're in dry scrubber, you got a dry scrubber, those are all very relatable issues. So they can help address those in those challenging operating environments. Uh, again, they, they've been a, uh, you know, involved with DSUA and just presented recently. So, you know, you want to learn more about what they can do, check out the June 2021 DSUA webinar. <clears throat> GE, they uh, name where probably a lot of us are, most everyone's probably familiar with. They've got a power portfolio that includes uh, steam power technology for fossil and nuclear applications, which includes boilers, generators, steam turbines, as well as the air quality control systems and digital solutions to help produce power efficiently and provide performance for the life of the plant. They've installed over 30% of the global steam turbine capacity and 50% of the steam turbines for nuclear plants and 30% for the world's boilers. They got over 1500 steam turbine module retrofits out there. They also help their customers with best in class upgrades and retrofits to the core operations and the maintenance across over 90 OEM brands. And they've got over 6,000 field service employees delivering solutions to secure Productive future for coal and nuclear plants across the globe. Um, and Travis Reynolds, want to give him a shout out. He's the vice president of DSUA from GE. Uh, been very helpful and you want to know more about GE, you can certainly reach out to him. And if you want to know more about uh, GE's dry scrubber technology, the, the NID scrubber system, um, you can check out the uh, TVA, the webinar they did. Um, Matt Wilson talked about the NID system and what they have installed at their sites. Uh, one of our newer sponsors this year, Carton Fujikin, they're a manufacturer of ceramic control valves with over 45 years globally, but 35 here, years here in the U.S. And their valves are designed for highly erosive and corrosive uh, media environments. So lime slurry, recycled ash, gypsum, you know, all the, the slurry applications that are found in EGUs with scrubbers. Their valves are used in an, also a number of industrial applications from pulp and paper to chemical and as well as the refining industry, but not exclusively. So um, again, if you uh, have a slurry service and need some ceramic valves, you know, reach out to Bill at Carton Fujikin. And real quick, just the last shout out to, uh, that's not all of our sponsors, but those are the ones we have slides for. You can see them all here. A big thank you to all of our sponsors for what they do for the association as well as the industry. And anyone that wants to learn more, uh, you see, our website down there, go to that. You can scroll down to our sponsors, click on their logo, go to their website. Um, and if you just ultimately wanna get in touch with someone and don't have contact information, you can see the dry scrubbers contact information there. You can find it on our website, reach out to us. We'll gladly help connect you guys. All right, so again, thank you sponsors and gonna turn over back to Mitch again for our second presentation.
All right, and Jerry, just as that a subtle reminder to uh, for the other sponsors to get us some slides so we can uh, give them shout outs as well on future webinars. Is that what that is? If they want, we appreciate what they do, but if they want to send a slide, we'll gladly give them, you know, for the recognition. Absolutely. Um, no, uh, we got a, a great second presentation as well. Um, I want to introduce our next presenter, Mr. Joe Haney. Um, Joe is a product manager at Industrial Accessories Company, IAC. Uh, Joe spent his entire career helping customers with uh, bag house and uh, solving bag house and dust collection performance issues. Um, he, decades ago, you wouldn't think it looking at him, but decades ago, he began uh, his career troubleshooting dust collectors and process related bag houses that included pharmaceutical, food, pulp and paper industries. Uh, that eventually expanded to other industries like carbon black, uh, cement, and power. Uh, Joe worked for over 20 years at, at BHA, Bag House Accessories, uh, before joining uh, IAC to help manage their smart plant initiatives, which is gonna, what he's going to be presenting about today, smart, uh, smart plant remote monitoring systems. Should be an interesting presentation. So Joe's a graduate of University of Missouri, Kansas City, UMKC. Uh, I am a fan of mascots, and I believe they are the kangaroos, if I remember right, Joe. So uh, tell me if I'm wrong there. But Joe lives in Kansas, and uh, look forward to hearing what he has to say about uh, remote monitoring. Take it away, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Mitch. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Uh, you should be seeing the first presentation slide. Is that correct? Yeah, good. All right. And um, before we get going here, thanks for that introduction, Mitch. And uh, I would encourage anybody like that last presentation uh, to send questions via chat um, or save them from the end. Uh, but the more questions, the better. Um, that was pretty intimidating to follow uh, Travis on that. That, uh, that stuff's kind of way above my head in terms of uh, intelligence and uh, uh, say how complicated it is. So I'll hopefully uh, kind of simplify things with what we wanted to talk about. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to present today um, in regards to uh, smart plant technology. Um, this is our, our, our presentation on how to embrace remote monitoring for filtration equipment. One more clarification. Uh, the majority of my language today will be in regards to applying this technology to dust collection equipment. Uh, but hopefully I stress throughout this uh, that it is relatively universal and can be applied to other pieces of technology as well. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, first off, uh, there's some kind of oh buzzwords or, or terms that get used for this technology and, and, and what we're trying to do. And you'll, you'll hear uh, a lot about Industry 4.0 if you haven't already. Uh, it is something that there's a lot of communication about out there in the world, including ourselves, like you can see there on the screen right now. Um, really, the point is, is that in general, as I'll show you in a, a minute or two, this is connected technology, whereas it would have been, say, isolated in the past. Um, but the real point from our view is, if you are embracing this type of technology, remote monitoring or gateway technology, uh, it is not worth doing unless it's doing one of two, two things. So these systems should be providing information that you cannot currently access with ease um, on whatever given system you're trying to monitor. Uh, and, and the whole goal is we should be trying to push towards um, away from co corrective uh, and even preventative and into predictive maintenance. And in general, um, I like to do this in person when I can, but we're all sitting in a room right now with a light bulb somewhere in the room. Um, corrective maintenance would be waiting until that light bulb goes out and saying, hey, I have a problem and going and changing that light bulb out. Um, a better practice, and I know one that uh, Travis's employer GE likes to utilize is at least getting to predictive maintenance in the sense that, hey, we know that light bulb is gonna burn out in 24 months, uh, let's change them out in 20 months. So we're kind of getting ahead of that being a bigger problem. Well, our goal is to hopefully move even beyond that and into predict predictive maintenance in the sense that let's take a system, let's monitor it continuously, let's get better visibility of it, and let's get to the point where we can, uh, over months and years, 
know when a problem is going to occur uh, and, and maximize the life of, say, some of the replacement parts uh, or even avoid uh, environmental issues uh, that may happen with some of your associated equipment. Uh, I know we have uh, one more comment. We have a mix of manufacturers and end users. Uh, so I guess my goal would be to try and keep it relatively generic. So whatever said kind of applies to both of you. Uh, but again, if there's questions, uh, please let me know. So um, I did this slide predominantly for myself because I, I needed to remember, uh, but really there's four very defined industrial revolutions with the first starting in 1784. And that was the advent of things like the steam engine, uh, the loom, uh, machines and, and some optimization in regards to manufacturing. Uh, classy pictures like this uh, for steam uh, powered equipment. Uh, and that uh, was the standard for quite some time until the second industrial revolution began, AKA the technological uh, revolution. And that was the advent of readily available electricity uh, in virtually every manufacturing plant uh, in the world. Uh, and also coupled with that uh, revolution was the advent of the assembly line, obviously most commonly known uh, with Ford and what they did uh, in their manufacturing efforts. Seems small, but at the time it was a big deal uh, and something that a lot of manufacturing sites can still improve on uh, today as well. Um, the third revolution, the one that we've spent the majority of our lives working in, uh, it, it started in the 1960s. Uh, and that's when we move beyond just electricity to more electronic equipment, the advent of computers, and really the beginning of moving from analog to digital. Uh, that picture on your screen right now uh, is a early computer, probably had less computing uh, power than uh, the smartphones that we all have sitting uh, somewhere to our right or left right now. Um, and the one that we're living in now, and I would wager to say that we'll all kind of work through and then retire during, is the fourth industrial revolution, taking a lot of what would be automation um, and applying that to uh, manufacturing equipment, trying to get into that key worth of being predictive in regards to when maintenance needs to be performed uh, and connecting that, fit, uh, that physical world uh, with a digital connection and you get cool pictures like this one on your screen with smartphones and headshots and bright ideas and light bulbs and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's pretty broad in regards to uh, what it is and what it can do. Um, but really in, in our world, um, which predominantly is manufacturing and dust collection equipment, my opinion is um, there's really four uh, big moments in regards to um, technology uh, specifically in air pollution control. And the first would be uh, pulse jet uh, technology. There's a bunch of users uh, in here and some of the most fun I had in my career, which yes, technically is decades long. I started rounding up when I got to 20 years and I'm just calling it decades now. So um, pulse jet technology, that's one that's intimately familiar in particular with the coal-fired boiler industry. It was a lot of fun in the 90s when old bag houses were being replaced with new pulse jet technology. They were huge. Uh, they were a big improvement. Um, it was kind of fun to work with folks as they cycled through uh, the maintenance and planning for those. But right out of the box and compared to old technology, it almost automatically made dust collectors uh, more efficient and helped um, adhere to a lot of the stringent guidelines they had to from an environmental standpoint. Surprisingly at that time, in particular with the coal-fired boiler industry, most new coal-fired boilers, when they put in multi-compartment pulse jet dust collectors, they did so without EPTFE membrane, without dwelling on it too long. That's technology that um, uh, you put on the surface of a filter bag that drastically increases its capture uh, rate and, uh, and efficiency, um, and really took a lot of the guesswork out of um, really performance, complying, but even controlling pressure through a dust collector uh, in regards to predicting uh, performance. Not as much in the coal-fired industry, especially on the big, big uh, bag houses, although there are a couple people who might be attending, even one of your sponsors, who also uses uh, pleated filter elements 
in um, their big bag houses. So a pleated filter element is not a big, large cartridge like what you might picture, 12 inches by 26. It fits in a traditional hole inside a, a dust collector and replaces a traditional bag and cage. Well, why is that a big moment? Well, first of all, it's my opinion. Uh, second of all, um, you really took what would be a, a bag house that's operating at its limit and artificially increased your filtration area to really grow you a bigger bag house. And then eventually it was embraced by OEMs and they started to um, use them for new equipment, shrinking down the physical size of the collector, uh, making the footprint smaller, using less steel, and helping to control the costs of uh, new installations. Shockingly, I think that remote monitoring technology is that next big leap in this industry. Uh, really, if any manufacturers are listening right now, and if you've been at your plant site for a long time, you are doing less with more. You have fewer people doing maintenance than you did 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, tools are required to help maximize the time of your staff while they're on site during a given shift. Um, so what, what is this technology? Uh, here's a big eyesore uh, to look at what it is. Different customers key in on different things on this slide. But at the bottom line is this. What we're talking about traditionally with bag houses and dust collectors is that top portion uh, on this slide. Take traditional controls for dust collection equipment, replace them with something that connects to a cellular network and can transmit data to a cloud, and then take advantage of that data and how you choose to maintain and service that equipment. So really just trying to narrow it down a little bit. Uh, what we're talking about here for a properly designed um, universal gateway would be something that transmit to a, transmits to a cloud, um, then notifies you in a chosen method that would be an improvement upon whatever you can do today. Um, and again, most of our focus uh, started in bag house and bag house equipment, um, but inevitably it kind of grows beyond that. And as you'll see here, what we're really talking about is any analog or digital signal in equipment or at your manufacturing site that someone would be more interested in or benefit from monitoring remotely. So I have to try and go ahead, Jerry. I got two questions for you real quick yeah, while, while we're on it. Um, I'm going to start. I, I throw myself at the mercy with a dumb question. I've seen IoT out there before. Um, yeah. Can you tell me re what, really what, it, what is IoT? What, it, what does it mean? Yeah. Sure enough, yeah, and it really, let's go back to this image right here. I know it's a corny little image, but that goes back to standing for Internet of Things. And the more you look at it, you'll even see IIoT, which is really our space, which is Industrial Internet of Things. So that is really the, the process of taking existing equipment and connecting it to the Internet to take advantage of, you know, say, uh, transmitting information, um, having an alarm for when something's gone sideways or notifying you when you need to perform some sort of maintenance. This type of technology ultimately is software, but it's delivered via hardware that you see that on the top of this circle. It didn't start in the industrial sector uh, though, Jerry, like the, where this type of industrial or universal gateway started, believe it or not, was um, the big cities like for instance, where they have Amazon lockers where people's Amazon orders get delivered. Well, they put a gateway on that, which is a yes, no, a zero or one to let Amazon know when someone opens that locker and takes their order. It's a very simple way and a very effective way for them to track when something's delivered. Um, so that would be an example of applying the internet or IOT to uh, an application where they couldn't get that information before. And, and one, one kind of general question to just clarify um, the opportunity, because I feel like as a, if I'm sitting in a plant, I see this as one, this is a way to remotely get information to other folks at the plant. So if they're not there, we all love to be connected 24 seven, right? So this is an, another way to kind of stay connected remotely, but as, as another side to it, um, whether it's a, a vendor or um, a consultant, someone that's providing a service, this is another means of 
of having someone else provide some degree of service or monitoring or the ability to just to kind of put eyes on, on specific operational equipment to help, I guess, help support end users to identify, like you said, proactively identify solutions rather than waiting to the point that, like, did, did I capture that appropriately or yeah. whatever you add to and that? It, and it gets pretty broad. I mean, somebody could hypothetically take advantage of this um, by trying to reduce inventory. And what I mean is, let's say you have five connected dust collectors that have 500 bags you keep in inventory. Well, if you can get to that pre predictive point of knowing when they're gonna fail, maybe you keep less on the shelf than you would have before. We've seen that scenario. In the first presentation by Travis, uh, SO2 was mentioned multiple times. We had a scenario where there's a company out there, uh, and how do I say it? There's a company out there that has promised that they can take the uh, stack gas from a cement manufacturing plant, capture it, and take that SO2 back into the lime kiln to take 100% lime and turn it into a cementaceous material. So they're eliminating some raw ingredients and they've proven it out. Well, the point is in regards to this remote monitoring technology is their uh, beta site was four hours from their office. And they really had two big measurables that they had to keep track of to make sure their system was working. And that was pH levels and flow, two analog signals. Uh, so they can put that system in and instead of taking a four hour drive, wake up, make a cup of coffee and take a look at that data to make sure they don't need to go out to that customer site and service the, on that given day. Yeah, and, and as I say here, as a, uh, from the Lime supplier perspective, um, working with customers that <clears throat> I know that they get less and less staff to help kind of take care of something. And I look at something as simplified as monitoring, say the inventory of your silo. And, uh, you know, if someone has the ability to kind of have eyes on that remotely, maybe just specifically that, again, it has another set of eyes to do some proactive, say, normally you order by now, I'm going to look at your inventory. So I I'm just, like, I see a lot of different opportunities on how this yeah. could be utilized from a, from a big picture, even a, a small thing is something like that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, any, any, okay. any industrial, any industrial site probably has fewer full-time employees than they used to. Um, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because we, we stress to most of our customers that we see this as a maintenance tool, not necessarily a compliance tool. Um, with the goal being, let's take uh, you know, that remote system or that bag house that's 200 feet off the ground and, and give you notification as to its status. So if and when you go up to fix something, you're taking the right tools, the right parts, and you're doing it way ahead of time as, as opposed to uh, waiting, uh, you know, for a, a maintenance walk once a week, once a month, whatever it might be. Well, and it's a, it's a great point because I, I imagine if someone sitting out there right now at a site is the first thing that goes off in their head is sensitivity about data transmitting. And from what I, if I'm understanding correctly, it's selective data. And like you said, most importantly, not a compliance tool. So you're not exactly sending all of your data. So if you want someone to manage your bag house operation, for example, they're not necessarily getting all the signals for your PM emissions or your SO2. And Precisely. you can, you can yep. end users can selectively pick the data, make sure that nothing sensitive is, is getting out, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, and take, you know, the lime industry, for instance, more than likely your biggest and most important bag house on the kiln is probably already connected to a PLC, probably already has a monitoring device. Um, we don't need to touch that. You know, we could look at it being a much smaller type of application, those ones that are maybe neglected or not connected to a central control room uh, to have better visibility of those units. Um, so really regardless of which one we, I have to simplify stuff for myself to understand it. Um, so really I'm looking at four words. Let's take uh, an existing application, an existing signal that you have low visibility of right now. Let's get it connected. Let's start to collect that information in regards to what you're monitoring. Let's get to the point where we're able to predict when there's going to be a problem. And then let's start working on improving that problem. So here's an eyesore for you, but a lot of information in regards to why use connected gateway systems. Anyone who would provide a, a connected gateway or, or something on a cellular signal uh, to monitor uh, should help with what we would refer to as a virtual health check. Um, 
you know, I, I, the word complies right there. And I just said, it's not a compliance tool. I should reconsider that slide. Uh, but the reality is, is that it does help with that. It does help eliminate, eliminate downtime. Um, one of the biggest things we do on dust collectors with these is apply a very cheap little um, air header pressure monitor. Any dust collector, especially pulse jet out there, uh, requires a certain amount of pressure to clean the bag house and control pressure. Uh, well, if you're losing uh, header pressure, you're, you're not going to know if and when you're cleaning that dust collector correctly. And, and it just leads to a cascading effect of issues and increased maintenance costs, all that kind of stuff. Um, we want to help get to the point of getting into predictive maintenance, um, which is about the third or fourth time I've said that. We also want to avoid the issue of what we call alarm fatigue. So any of these systems will have a certain threshold out the box. Take differential pressure, for instance, in a bag house. We may choose to set it at a certain level, but then we may find that um, you're, you're operating above a given differential pressure point uh, continuously um, and maybe everything's fine. So we would need to adjust that level at that point to you know, keep maintenance staff from getting 12, 15 alarms during a given shift. Um, we have seen folks utilize this for uh, replacing uh, manual record keeping. Uh, so a lot of manufacturing sites require a walk to go out and record uh, maybe differential pressure, uh, maybe pulse count, whatever it might be. And uh, this system could effectively automate a lot of that. Uh, because what we're doing is capturing any analog or digital signal, uh, we've had folks um, start to branch well beyond bag houses and dust collectors. So temperature or vibration, uh, protecting uh, expensive motors, um, whatever structure or whatever part of your manufacturing equipment you would have. Um, if you have the ability to take that signal out, you can, uh, you can capture it and take advantage of it. Um, brain drain. Uh, a lot of sites uh, have had a lot of folks uh, in their careers um, and, and maybe uh, a manufacturing site or an equipment provider um, is having a difficult time replacing uh, that person that had a, a lot of knowledge in their head. Uh, well, let's get somewhere where we're not trying to take a guess as to the condition of a piece of equipment. Let's simply record uh, some measurables on that equipment uh, and eliminate that brain drain issue. Um, really, that next one there is, is the biggest one for our customers, and that is unplanned outages. I know it's always been a bad thing, but it seems like that's such a huge measurable uh, for folks in regards to tracking operating costs and that kind of thing. Um, so if this is if this is a system that can kind of prevent one unplanned outage, it's typically going to pay for itself. So what you see on your screen right now is a very crude example of what you would see in a portal. So uh, universal gateway is applied, signals are brought in, um, that is sent to the cloud and then it's sent to a portal where you would log in and you would see something like this on your screen. Well, what jumps out here? Immediately you see that you have a low header pressure alarm. I already mentioned it, but any bag house that's gonna operate at low header pressure is not gonna clean, pressure is gonna rise, that dust is gonna try and find somewhere to go. And that's usually gonna be one of two places. It's either gonna go through the filter or it's gonna go around the filter and then nobody's happy. Um, beyond that, we're looking at tracking a lot of the basic stuff that you would wanna know about a given dust collector, uh, pressure, uh, inches of water column across the surface of the filters, uh, temperature, uh, and then getting on down to other stuff you can add. Hertz frequency for a fan. Uh, what's the uh, motor amps? Uh, what's the pressure at the stack? How long is an individual pulse duration? Let's put all of that in the palm of your hand. And then the last one there, the biggest number, is uh, pulse count. Uh, a lot of dust collectors do not have that as a default. But uh, the pulse count for a dust collector uh, kind of equates to the mileage on a car tire. Um, so when you hit 50,000 miles on a tire, um, you can be darn sure that you're going to run into problems pretty quick because they've got that down to a science. Well, a filter bag inside a dust collector is only going to fail one of three ways. It's going to fail chemically, it's going to fail thermally, or it's going to fail mechanically. The first two... Um, usually indicate an upset condition or the wrong type of filter. You, you over-tempted, uh, you exposed it to 
uh, acid condensation while you flirted with dew points. Something's going on in the baghouse that is going to lead to early failure. Once you've eliminated those and you get to mechanical failure, assuming that the filter bag manufacturer uh, made the bag correctly and it was installed correctly, everything's right in regards to how it's made, that filter will fail mechanically eventually. So that's why we like to track pulse cycles because we know that those replacement filters only have so much life in them, like mileage on a car tire, uh, before they're going to need to be replaced. So this is one real world example. Uh, it doesn't look like too big a deal, but again, um, after we've installed a bunch of these, and, and I should stop myself, I meant to say earlier, um, this is all new technology. And, uh, you know, we don't have one installed yet in the power industry. So that's just a, a moment of honesty, but um, it, it can and could be embraced uh, moving forward. Um, so the examples I'm providing are not in the power industry or really anybody that would be in the, uh, the Dry Scrubbers User Association, just for the record. Hey, um, hey Joe, on, on that note, why you said that, you know, I'm sure it's a question other people would have, or, you know, it's a question in my head is, is, you know, from my, my experience working closely with a lot of end users, I could see the potential of other people getting access to only specific data um, and being able to offer support, some services, and probably more so now since we live in a virtual world in so many ways that we didn't two years ago. You know, what kind of elephant in the room, like what, what do you think are the biggest hurdles for people going forward and, and at least digging into this and evaluating if it, if it makes sense? Is it a philosophical change that this is just so different than how they are? Are there concerns about, you know, sensitive data getting out or, you know, another, another thought in my head too is, you know, um, you know, the cost associated with implementing this. And since it's more, seems like it's based on preventative maintenance, kind of like you talked about, I imagine someone's got to see an ROI and maybe with maintenance, it's harder to quantify like an ROI, like what, maybe it's all of those things, like, but what, you know, what do you think are the biggest hurdles yeah. for people moving there forward? Are this? Questions. Um, the, the one I'll immediately eliminate is cost. This is a pretty low cost system. Um, it's effectively, you know, about in the price range of what it would cost to replace the existing control system on a dust collector. Um, I would say, you know, to your question, Jerry, a little bit of it is the newness of it. Um, anybody who has an existing dust collector right now with a traditional control system, Everything's kind of okay. Uh, it's very tried and true hardware. Um, it has worked that way for a long, long time. Um, and so they may be at a point where they kind of see that as, you know, not a problem, not something they need to address. Um, if, if, if customers are watching the ROI closely though, that becomes the biggest thing. So, you know, where we've seen a lot of success is companies where someone is responsible for driving down cost or eliminating unplanned outages. Um, and I will show some slides on that here in a moment. But it is new technology. Um, kind of to your other question of IoT, it's a lot of buzzwords, a lot of uh, stuff that you'll read about. And that Enviro Summit that Travis uh, referenced, I guarantee <laughs> there's going to be uh, some presentations uh, at that down the road uh, in regards to this technology as well. Um, but again, this, this slide here um, from a, uh, I, I can't remember if I said it or not, but really what we're delivering here is when we build it is, is software delivered via hardware. Uh, so the software on this screen runs on 10 minute averages. So every 10 minutes we're sending a signal to the cloud and we're getting that alarm. So really within 10 minutes. So this example here, you can see that huge spike downward when they lost header pressure. That is something that could have dragged on for days or potentially weeks in that given dust collector. Whereas in this instance, it was fixed, you know, within an hour. Um, so whether it's the maintenance of the system itself or the cost savings on not wasting compressed air, uh, it starts to pile up pretty quick. And I'll show a little bit more on ROI in a second. And I'll also try and finish up within a few minutes just to stay on schedule. Um, without diving too far into this, you're welcome to read the words on your screen. But one of our most established installations was one where it's like, okay, we recognize this now. Let's really kind of customize an alarm schedule so we can get to the point where maybe two or three 
maintenance personnel get a low level alarm so they can go address it and see what's going on with it. Well, you can tier those alarms so you don't get that alarm fatigue of too many notifications too often. Um, getting to the point where all the way, if something's really gone bad, uh, a bag house is emitting continuously, you've lost control of a process, uh, vibrations th uh, shot through the roof, whatever it might be. Well, then maybe you're letting the plant manager or, or, or even an executive within a company know that you have that type of issue. And all of that stuff's possible with a properly designed gateway system. Joe, so, uh, I, I know, this, I, I know this is an important slide. Just want to give um, yourself and our uh, viewers a heads up that uh, we're going to target going until 11.35, 11.36 type of time frame to stay on schedule here. So just want to give you the time now. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, ROI is the big thing where it comes in. And, and generally speaking, what I can say is these systems will really pay for itself if just one of these is eliminated one time. I'm probably pretty conservative on that reduction of downtime number. Um, that's just one customer in particular and how they measure it. Um, I, I know sometimes that probably gets into five figures for folks <laughs> if they're going down uh, on, a, on a bigger application. Uh, can we eliminate an, uh, an outage? Can we, um, can we eliminate somebody who say is a corporate environmental manager who has to travel twice a year to different sites? Can you eliminate a trip? Um, what does it mean for you if you get quicker uh, response on a unit uh, or you eliminate uh, exposure during an upset condition as well? Uh, it's pretty easy to start attacking some of these numbers pretty quick with this type of system. Um, and before we go, this is where I get pretty geeked out on it. Um, we're, we're talking about any analog or digital signal. We started with a pretty defined set of what we wanted to do. People have started to ask to do more and more with it. Um, I want to mention that out of the box, any system should be at least telling you your differential pressure and your pulse counter on a bag house. But like you can see on here, there's plenty of other things you can look at potentially doing, including on the top left, that first digital signal, um, explosion proofing uh, a lot of equipment, something that's increased over the last 10 years. That's a simple signal to tell you whether or not you've had that issue. And uh, really, a lot of times you may not know uh, and, and uh, as quickly as you could from being uh, pushed that notification that something's occurred. So what happens once you put it, maybe you put it on a couple bin vents, it works, you know the differential pressure, you know how often you're pulsing, that's great. But the question starts to become where else can we put it? Well, wherever you wanna put it. If you need to track an analog or digital signal, again, a universal gateway should give you the capability to do that with ease. Um, we've seen them put uh, on a lot of silos, uh, level indicators. No one wants to climb up that silo to go troubleshoot whether or not your, your levels are correct. Well, let's, let's tie that into a level indicator to give you significantly better awareness as to whether or not you have uh, an issue in that given silo. Well, what about um, you know, pressure in that silo? Or even um, whether or not um, you know, a burp vent has, uh, I think that's what we still call them, a burp vent has released, whatever it might be. Again, simple process to take that signal, tie it into that cloud, and give you that awareness well before what you would be able to accomplish uh, uh, without that type of technology. So that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Mitch, Jerry, if you have more questions or if there's questions from the audience, uh, let's hit them if we have time. Well, I, I just see, uh, you know, I think with you presenting and we talked prior to this is uh, the opportunities I see it as, and, and working closely with a lot of customers and when you use an example where I, I think people look at this holistically and think like, I got to send all my operating information, but to give you an example where I, I feel like it could be used is I'm going to pick on cement plants because every time I go there, I feel like they're understaffed and guys, guys look like they always got done working an 18 hour shift when they're there and say they've got a, like a lime injection system and they're not looking at say blower pressures. And meanwhile, their blower discharge pressures are creeping up and up and up means their lines starting to occlude and scale off. Now say that, you know, those, because those guys are, are tasked to make cement, you know, so that's really their primary focus. So now maybe a corporate engineer who's not at the plant, like you said, can get remote access and just know that I need to look at that. Or you hire a very studious consultant such as Mitch Lund or your lime supplier or your equipment, somebody that, you know, will take some responsibility on the service or just offer that to say, and they pull up your data once a day and just go oh, like crap I see your pressure is going up and 
like they bring notice to the, the folks at the plant and say, hey, I think you have a problem because if you don't deal with it now, your blowers are, you're going to hit a point where all of a sudden your blowers are going to trip. And then all those guys become very reactive at that point and go off, start pulling elbows and rotting them out real quick because they know at some point without feeding wine, their emissions are going to start to go up and they're going to have a real problem. And if the very worst case situation happens, they shut their plant down right? Or they pay a very large fine for being out of compliance. And the same can be said about, say, silo inventory. Just, I think we're getting more and more of it to an age where do more with less. And that happens at all of the sites, <clears throat> excuse me, industrial sites. So I just, you know, I think sometimes I feel like when people look at this, and now you've talked to me about it, I feel like it's looked at so broadly and people fail to, in that ROI, <clears throat> it's hard to, I think, quantify because how do you, how do you quantify the what if? You know, um, how, what, how do you quantify that time? The guys got too busy and they ran out of lime and like, they couldn't get and that, and trucks that's, there. That scenario, that scenario you described uh, when, when, when you have the buildup, I assume if it's anything like a dust collector, the knee jerk reaction would be just to simply inject more lime. Is that correct? If you start seeing buildup in your conveying line system, um, honestly, I feel like people will tend to just let it ride until it, yeah. it the, yeah. The average person, not everybody, will probably either not notice it until you see a linear increase and then it exponentially takes off. And that's the point where you're, you're, you're going to start putting enough back pressure, your blower is going to trip and you can't convey. So if you can get, you know, better, aware, better awareness of that, that would, you know, just to flip it back to dust collection, you know, that, that would be a scenario where, uh, hey, we're not pulling draft through a dust collector. So what does a maintenance personnel do? They take a damper and they push it 100% open so they can pull as much air through there as possible. That's fine temporarily, but the reality is, is that, you know, that damper is not meant to be that wide open. And you're probably gonna pull too much dust back from whatever point you're trying to ventilate, send too much dust to the bag house. And it just, again, leads to that long-term list of issues where the bag house does not wanna perform. Whereas if you can get more early awareness of uh, what the problem actually is, uh, you're going to extend out the life of that piece of equipment. I just think there's a lot of things big and small that, you know, that this could help address if done and implemented properly. So I'm hopeful that people see that because uh, in a manufacturing process, something like a Lyme injection system, I'm picking on that because I, I mean, I deal with that all the time is, you know, it kind of, it's as important as your raw materials. Cause if you don't have that running, like it can shut you down, but it kind of gets secondary attention because you're focused on is producing your widget. Yeah. So I just, sorry, yeah, I just, well, I just think people well, get right. so wrapped up well, in all of my data is going out that they, yeah, they well, miss the opportunity collector. here. Nobody wants to deal with, uh, I know dust collectors, I would assume sometimes dealing with the Lyme injection system, they want it to work correctly and be low maintenance. So if we were in a room together and we asked for a show of hands of folks who like the do maintenance on live injection systems or like to get inside a bag house, the hands are probably going to go down. Uh, so if we can, if we can do something to, to help with those two scenarios. That's our goal. No, that's, that's excellent. Joe, uh, Joe, one thing I wanted to make sure last comment here, I know that you had mentioned in our uh, prep meeting that this technology basically goes everywhere. IAC goes for new systems. I take it that this can be retrofitted to existing systems as well. Yes, sir. And that that's predominantly we were think uh, even compared to our own installations that uh, the lowest hanging fruit is, is um, you know, those those dust collectors that are not on a plant uh, PLC, not on a, a not in a control room up a 100 foot ladder installed and existing. There's more bag houses out there already operating than there will be built in the next 10 years. So that's where we want to help. Yep. Figured that was the case. Just want to make sure our audience is aware of that. So I know that we're a little bit over time. Great, great presentation, Joe. I think that this is an important uh, subject for future, <laughs> for future work, frankly. I mean, I, this has to be getting everywhere over the next 5, 10, 15 years. So um, good stuff. Glad to see that IAC is in incorporating into their offering. That's good. That's awesome. Jerry, I, I think without further ado, I don't know if you have any other further announcements for uh, ESPN. No, I think, uh, and, and last thing on... I I don't have stock in IEC and I frankly didn't even really know what IOT exactly stood for, but I just know that a lot of these things, I, I just see huge opportunity because, you know, being on a consumable part and hearing the problems of people and, 
you know, the, their equipment, I, I just see like a huge opportunity that if someone wants to implement this to various degrees, like, you know, we, we lived the theme in 2019 at DSUA of work smarter, not harder. And uh, I think like I can see that, understand this, a phil philosophical change of things, but I, I just feel like it could make a lot of people's lives easier uh, if implemented properly. So it, I, I get kind of excited, you know I mean? So it's, it's super interesting, Joe, and I appreciate uh, the presentation and all the folks that stayed on to join while we ran long. And I apologize for that. So um, my, my quick wrap up is, you know, thank you again, Joe and Stephen for, you know, presenting today. Thanks to Mitch, as always, for, for moderating. Um, again, our sponsors, as well as all the DSUA board members and everyone that's kind of helped us through all these webinars. Uh, stay tuned. The recording will come. So Joe and Steve, if you saw someone that was attending and hopped off, uh, send, send the recording, anyone on here that, uh, you know, you want to watch this again, or you want to share it with folks, um, you know, the recording will be available. And as long as we have your email address or you check the website or the LinkedIn page, you'll, you'll find the recording uh, within the next week or hopefully a couple of days. And uh, stay tuned for the next webinars or, you know, you want to see more content. We've got the archives with all the presentations and, Again, the website, we, we kind of make it easy for you to find all the past webinars. So um, thank you again. Until then, we'll, we'll see you guys next month with another webinar. Good. Take thank care. you, Harry. Stay safe.